old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning, then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory, and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story, and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Well, I'm certainly happy to be back with you this week and uh, am feeling uh, much better, obviously, uh, but I do appreciate your prayers, and all of us here are, are improving, and so we're thankful to God for that improvement. We're in our seventh study from the book of 1 Corinthians, and we'll be looking at chapter 5 in this study. And in this chapter, Paul deals with an immoral situation in the church there at Corinth that was defiling the church. And he tells them that they should not glory in such behavior. We may wonder why Paul would speak to the Corinthians about glorying in such behavior. Of course, we may have similar situations in churches today where what the Bible condemns as immoral behavior is celebrated and churches even seem proud that they are so broad-minded and so open to new lifestyles. There is no call for repentance and there is no discipline exercised. In fact, those who condemn the immoral behavior are the ones who are accused of being judgmental and unloving. How could churches glory in such behaviors today? In this lesson, we want to observe a few things from the Bible regarding the church and what Paul says, not only to the church at Corinth, but what he said to the church in Ephesus and also what he wrote to the young evangelist Timothy. We will try to understand what Paul teaches us about the dangers that the church faces, even from within, and how churches will evolve in view of the desire of some to hear what they want to hear, despite plain Bible teaching about immorality and departures from the truth. Let's read from uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 13, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. <clears throat> it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. 
In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit and with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. <coughs> Excuse me. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would have to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do judging those who are outside. Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. <coughs> the specific sin uh, in this case was incest. A man had taken his father's wife, and we're not told if the father was living or not. And this type of immoral behavior was even condemned <coughs> among the heathen people. It was not something to be proud of. It was something to purge from their midst. He says that the Corinthians were puffed up. And instead of mourning this situation, the Corinthians were either ignoring it or actually proud of their tolerance of the man. Since there is never any mention of the discipline of the woman involved, we believe that she was most likely a Gentile <coughs> and not a member of the congregation. We don't know if the father and mother were separated or divorced, and we are not told if the son had married his mother or if they were just living together. It makes little difference since whatever the situation was, it was immoral and against the principles of Christian living. The word mourn that is used here is like the mourning of a death. And Paul said that they should have been mourning, but instead they were puffed up. It was a matter of shame for the church, but they were glorying in it. Paul indicates that the man involved must be put away from among you. In verses three through five, Paul speaks of his being absent in the body, but present in spirit. Paul says that he has already judged the situation and he calls for a gathering of the church to deal with the situation. This was not going to be done privately, but openly by the church. And Paul claims the authority of Jesus for the action when he says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, they were to assemble and act in the name of the Lord and by the instruction of the apostle Paul. Now, there are differing opinions on what delivering the man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh may mean. Some believe that it is similar to what happened to Ananias and Sapphira when they lied to the Holy Spirit and died immediately, as recorded in the book of Acts. They believe this kind of action was only possible for the apostles of the Lord and can no longer happen today. Others believe it was more a matter of a withdrawal of fellowship to the man in order to cause him to repent and change his situation. Some believe this man and perhaps his father are referred to in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 12 where <coughs> Paul writes, Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done this wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. It is asserted by some that the action taken by the church corrected the situation and that Paul is referring to this same situation here in 2 Corinthians 7. 
Whether or not this is the case, it is made clear that the action Paul advised in this case was a matter to be addressed by the church toward a member of the church and not something they were to exercise against every fornicator in the world that they might have contact with. Uh, this would make no sense because the action was something the church was to perform on a member of the congregation. Paul makes this clearer at the end of the chapter. Well, what do some of the other Bible patches teach us that might be helpful in understanding both the dangers to the church that exist within and without, and also about the church departing from the truth? I want to read uh, first from Acts chapter 20, and this is when the Apostle Paul calls the elders uh, of Ephesus down to Miletus and speaks to them. He's on his way back to Jerusalem. We want to read verses 17 uh, down through verse 32 of Acts chapter 20. Uh, from Miletus, he, that is Paul, sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the very first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility and with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone day and night with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The Apostle Paul warns the elders from Ephesus that there will be dangers both from outside the church and also from inside the church. And the whole purpose of his teaching had been, he said, repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul points us to the word of his grace which he said is able to build us up. The church is not to be guided by public opinion or even by the opinions of a select few within the congregation. They are to be guided by the Word of God. And that is where we will find the true guide to proper conduct and moral principles. And so in this passage, Paul emphasizes the fact that he had warned them, he said, for over three years, day and night, with tears, teaching them about repentance and faith toward God. And now he is commending them to the Word of God that he says will be able to, to keep them and help them and give them an inheritance among all those that are sanctified in the Lord. Uh, so in this passage of Scripture, we learn these truths about the church. There are dangers to the church, and we have to... Uh, exercise caution and be sure that we use God's Word to judge situations, not public opinion, not giving in to the, uh, the mores and the morals of the day. 
You know, when we give in to that, a lot of times we talk about a new morality, but really it's not new morality at all. It's just the same old immorality that has been here in the world since the time of Adam and Eve. So we are encouraged to look into God's Word and to be guided by His Word. Another passage is the letter that Paul wrote to the young evangelist Timothy. We want to read 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5, where Paul wrote, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. So you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Of course, this work of the evangelist was to preach the word, to be ready in season and out of season, to rebuke, exhort, <coughs> and to teach with all long suffering and doctrine, is what he teaches the Apostle Paul. Over the past 30 years or so, I have watched as various churches around the world have made drastic changes in their doctrines. And much of it, of course, was in keeping with the times in which we're living. The various uh, movements that have come through, like the women's rights movement, uh, other movements that have taken place in more recent years, dealing with homosexuality and other sexual issues. And so over this 30-year period, when all these things have been changed very drastically, there have been changes in their doctrines, and in order to do what they wanted to do, they had to first undermine the authority of the Bible. And so thus, time after time, religious bodies would question the inspiration of the Scripture. They would come together in their congresses and their con convic uh, conventions and would vote on whether or not the Bible is inspired. And of course, a lot of them would vote it out. A lot of times the thing was split and people would split off and start another uh, group because the conservatives maybe did, want, did not want to uh, go along with what they wanted. But once they had dispensed with the Bible being inspired, then they could teach whatever they wanted to and whatever they decided to teach by their own authority. And so this is what has happened repeatedly over the years. Paul warned that when people have itching ears and want to hear certain things, that they will depart from the truth. The situation we face today is similar in some respects to the church at Corinth, but in one way it is very different. Was there more than one congregation in Corinth? It is generally believed that there may have been only one congregation under the local eldership in places like Corinth and Ephesus. Today, we have different churches all over town. You know, sometimes we'll say, well, there's a church on every corner. Uh, for this man, of course, at Corinth, to be out of fellowship with the church meant that he had nowhere else to turn unless he wanted to embrace a pagan religion. The action taken against him by the church left him with no other church to which he could belong, at least not in Corinth. Today, when people are disciplined or they are reprimanded by the church, they might just move to another congregation of people in the same town. The discipline that the church may exercise is thus blunted by the situation in which we find ourselves. The truth is that the only authority an elder truly wields in a congregation is the power of his own godly example of leadership. Elders are not dictators, even though some may try to assume that role. Elders are leaders. And the metaphor 
of the elder as a shepherd is appropriate as we see in various places in the passage we read in Acts 20 in verse 28 to shepherd the church of God, the elders were told. The elder is to care for the flock and to lead them forth. The power of his godly influence is the real measure of an elder's effectiveness. Well, later in verses uh, 7 and 8, or 6 through 8, in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul makes reference to leaven. And in the New Testament, leaven often refers to some evil principle. And in this case, of course, it was the immorality that was threatening the church at Corinth. They are encouraged to purge out the old leaven. Of course, Paul is speaking metaphorically here as he talks about Christ being our Passover who was sacrificed for us. We are made clean by the blood of Christ. And the feast that is mentioned here is not the Jewish Passover and it's not even the communion of the Lord. It refers to purging out sin and it refers to our Christian life and fellowship. We are to walk, as Paul said, in sincerity and truth. In verses 9 through 13, Paul had written in a previous letter that he mentions here, but we do not have this letter. We assume that it had been lost. But he explains that what he meant when he wrote earlier was not to keep company with the sexually immoral within the church and not to those out in the world generally. He makes it clear that the discipline that is to be exercised is within the congregation for the good of the church. He mentions here sexual immorality, covetousness, extortioners, idolaters, even drunkards and other things. If a brother or sister is engaged in this kind of lifestyle, Paul says not to keep company with them, not even to eat with them. The eating may refer to common meals or the love feast that they sometimes had or maybe even the Lord's Supper. But the rule laid down here is that we are to forego any association with a brother or sister in Christ who openly is walking in unfaithfulness to the principles of Christ. And of course, the purpose of this is to lead them to repentance and to restoration to a faithful life in Christ. We may be in situations at work or at school in which we must associate with people who do not practice the moral principles that we find in God's Word. We may not be able to avoid this at times, but we certainly must not seek to be involved in their immoral behavior. And we can't just go on, you know, living an immoral life at work during the week and then trying to uh, live a moral life on Sunday with church. We are called to live a faithful life to Christ. We are called to a different kind of lifestyle. And so the problem with so many, even of the churches today, is the failure to call for repentance, a total... Uh, just kind of glorying even today in the fact, as I said earlier, that we are so broad-minded and so willing to accept different lifestyles. The early church, and Paul wrote to Corinth, and he said that they were, they should have been mourning the fact that this was happening in their midst, but instead they were glorying in it. And so Paul tells them to correct that situation. In conclusion, we want to close with two passages from the book of 1 John in which John encourages us to avoid the temptations of the world and to cultivate our born-again position in Christ. First in 1 John 2, <clears throat> verses 15 through 17, John writes, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God 
abides forever. This is not the only passage. There were many we could refer to that talks about the difference that is to be between the Christian and the world. As Paul wrote to Titus, he said that we are a peculiar people chosen by God for good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Then the other passage is in 1 John 5, verses 18 through 21, where John writes, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. And of course, what John means here, and it's in the Greek aorist tense, I think they call it, uh, when he says that whoever is born of God does not sin, he means that they do not continue in an immoral, sinful lifestyle. It's not, not that we never make a mistake. He doesn't mean that we never do sin at all. But the idea is that when we do fail, we repent and we seek to follow the Lord as closely as we can. We are not to walk in the ways of the world around us, but we are to be born again from above and to be transformed to a new way of life. And so this discipline that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 5, about not associating with a, with a brother or sister who is immoral, sexually immoral, uh, you know, an idolater, uh, who has covetousness, extortion, uh, these kinds of things. He said, don't associate with them. And the purpose of it again is to call them to repentance. And so this is the way in which the church exercises uh, discipline. We are taught in more than one place that the word of God is useful for reproof, rebuke, <laughs> excuse, excuse me, and exhortation you know, that, that we may be encouraged to walk in faithfulness to Christ. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we do thank you <coughs> for this <coughs> instruction from the uh, pen of the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. And as we look around us in the world today, Father, we see that so often this admonition has, has been ignored and uh, we are so sorry that we have witnessed over the years those who have decided that the Word of God is not inspired, that they're not required to follow it any longer. When the Apostle Paul plainly told the elders from Ephesus that, and commended them to the Word of God that he said was able to build them up and to give them that inheritance of eternal life. And so we pray that we will cling tenaciously to your word, that we will read and study your word, that we may know uh, what you instruct us to do, that, that you, what you teach us that we should be doing. And help us, Father, to live a good example before others, because we realize this is the greatest uh, power that any of us exert, whether we're an elder or a deacon in the church or just a member of the church, that it is the power of our example that is uh, our greatest uh, gift that you have given us. And so help us, <coughs> Father, to be encouragers and to encourage others around us to be faithful to you and not to give in to the world, not to be a conformed to the world, but rather to be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So bless us to this end and bless congregations of your people throughout the world as they try to uh, encourage one another and, and as at times they have to uh, discipline maybe one another in some ways that, that we will all yield, Father, to 
the discipline of your word and that we will be drawn closer to you and closer to one another as we seek to do your will. We thank you above all for Jesus Christ, our Passover who was offered for us and by his blood that cleanses us from our sin. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, as uh, you can witness, I still have a little lingering cough uh, from now to then. I have little coughing sp uh, spells, but I'm feeling much better and I'm thankful for that. Uh, we pray that wherever you are, that you're doing well. And we look forward to seeing you again here next week as we continue our study in the book of 1 Corinthians. God bless and keep you. We read of a place that's called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. These truths in God's word he has given. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. The angels so sweetly are singing Up there by the beautiful sea The song of redemption is ringing How beautiful heaven must be How beautiful heaven must be, must be. Sweet home of the happy and free Fair haven of rest for the weary How beautiful heaven must be